This episode is scripted, narrated, recorded and edited by Newell Fisher, with script assistance by John Ruths. Hello, and welcome to the Watership Down podcast episode 63, in which we will be analysing section 5 of the 1978 film, The Departure. First of all, a few bits of burrow keeping. I've come across a review of a 2002 BBC Radio 4 radio play of Watership Down from the long-defunct site bitsandbobstones.watershipdown.org. There will be a link in the notes. I will also see if I can trace a copy of this radio version of the story. The site the review comes from is very old and not secure in modern terms, so proceed with caution. I've tried contacting the owner of the site, but without success. It does include some interesting resources which are worth a look, including an attempt to expand the Lapine language. On another subject, in episode 58, I misnamed Harry Andrews, who played General Woundwort in the film. This has now been corrected on the main feed, and thank you to Sean Hagins who pointed this out. I will be re-uploading the YouTube version this week. Sean has also pointed out that the Australian radio play was produced in 1984, not 1982, as I said last week. So then, on with the episode. This section covers from 11 minutes 50 to 14 minutes 10, and the equivalent chapters from the book are chapters 3 and 4, Hazel's Decision and the Departure. In the film, the entire process of Hazel deciding to leave Sandalford after the the disastrous meeting with the Chief Rabbit happens off-camera. In fact, the only substantial survival from Chapter 3 is Bigwig's announcement that he has resigned from the Owlsler, which happens under very different circumstances here. Instead, we move straight from the Chief Rabbit telling Bigwig Hazel and Fiverr had better be watched to a scene that proves how right he was, at least in this version of Sandalford, where outskirters are not just free to leave. It is night time and the subtle brass musical theme that accompanied Bigwig's Bigwig's dressing down moves to a more strings-based one as we see silhouettes emerge from a grass bank in a much faster way than such a disparate group would actually emerge. Let's look at this group a little more closely. We begin with what is clearly Hazel and Fiverr waiting to see who turns up. Next is Blackberry, who is mistaken for Dandelion by Hazel at first. In the book, Dandelion arrives next with Hawkbit, while Blackberry arrives next. After about seven more rapid arrivals, we hear a female voice who we can possibly assume is Violet. But then again, as Violet is not credited among the cast, possibly this is just a random doe. During this frenzied arrival of potential leavers, we also see kittens, or at least very young rabbits, arrive. As the number reaches 18, we hear the voice of Silver, who arrives from the right, warning that Owlsler member Toadflax followed him down the run. In the book, Owlsler member Silver arrives with Bigwig. Here he is a laconic sounding non owlsler amalgam of Hawkbit, Acorn, Speedwell and possibly Buckthorn. But it is he who warns that the owlsler may have been turned out. And so, as the camera zooms out, Hazel says they had better be off. We see a thread of mist above the departing group as a watching rabbit is revealed in the foreground by a fence who crouches low and frowns as the group departs. Is this Toadflax? The pace of the music increases as the group, now seemingly of 16 rabbits, rapidly make their way through the mist. This is from the Into the Mist track from the film's soundtrack. Large stringed instruments are plucked as violins become louder as our view zooms out to a clear view of the notice board that started all this. It says, This ideally situated estate, comprising six acres of excellent building land, is to be developed with high-class modern residences by Such and Martin Limited of Newbury Barks. This is identical to the wording in the book, but the letters are in red, not black, and the name Such is spelt without the T. The group, still seemingly of only 16 rabbits now, move past this to the left of camera. And now the music lulls for a moment as we see three more rabbits watching them for a fence line. The watching rabbits are, of course, the Owlsler, and they are watching positions by barbed wire fences, even though these are no barrier to rabbits, seem significant. There is a group of six rabbits out in front of the escaping group. In a closer shot, we clearly see Hazel, Fiverr, Pipkin, Blackberry and Dandelion. Silver and Violet do not appear in this shot. 
and then the brass section of the orchestra joins in, seeming to represent the owls in action, where the previous subdued brass music represented only the instructions of the chief. Hazel stops, looks back and notices them approaching as the other four pass him, shouting a warning to the others in close-up. We see the mobilised Owsler cut off the rear group of ten rabbits, which includes does and kittens, and in this further off indistinct shot looks like a group of eighteen rabbits, though some grass obscures our view. Captain Holly appears clearly in the foreground, checking they are all under guard, before continuing on after the forward group, who are now seen escaping into a ditch, presumably intended to be the brook that leads to the River Enborn, but dried up of this, at this time of year. We clearly see that this group of seven is Hazel, Fiverr, Pipkin, Blackberry, Dandelion, Silver and what is presumably Violet. And now we get a clear shot of the captured group of ten rabbits, seven adults and three kittens being guarded by five angry looking Owsler members. This confirms that the group who initially tried to leave Sandalford is 16 strong in the film, with seven getting away to be joined shortly by Bigwig, making eight in total. In the book, the group who leave is 11 strong, so here we have lost Hawkbit, Acorn, Speedwell and Buckform, but gained Violet. In another distant shot, we see the captured group of rabbits for the last time being laid back to Sandalford. And now again, this group seems more like 16. Did the animators lose count at some point, or did they just assume pedants such as me would never be able to analyse their work frame by frame? In any case, the group of seven are now halted in shock by the shadowy figure of Bigwig perched at the top of the ditch, seemingly very relaxed about the whole thing. Cannily, Hazel asks Bigwig if he is off duty, and he reveals that he has left the Owsler, although he does seem to have been obeying the last order he was given to watch the two lunatics, Hazel and Fiverr. In the book, he says that he has left the Owsler in Chapter 3, Hazel's decision, and this seems to be the only survival from that chapter in the film. As Bigwig, Bigwig remains higher up, talking to Fiverr and Hazel about the fact that they are leaving, we see the point of view of an approaching rabbit who seems not to recognise Bigwig's voice or realise he is even present. This is the black-nosed Captain Holly, who jumps into the ditch on his own to arrest the entire group of seven rabbits. In the book, Holly arrives with two other Owsler members in order to arrest only Bigwig and Silver as Owsler members who have abandoned their duty. But here he is more foolhardy and arrogant, which seems in keeping with this nasty aversion of the Sandalford Owsler. There is no mention of Silver being in the Owsler, so this is a lone captain of Owsler detaining six bucks and a doe who simply want to leave and assuming they will just obey him. Oddly enough, Blackberry, Hazel and Dandelion all briefly express confusion as to why they are being arrested, though they may just be playing innocent. Bigwig, still at the top of the ditch, stays silent as he has not been seen by Holly. Is he still deciding what to do? The charges against the whole group are the same as in the book. Only in this Sandalford, such charges apply to anyone, making this definitely a militarised warren along the lines of Ephrafa, where Heisenthal says she is under orders to Bigwig at one point. Fiverr tries to appeal to Holly about the approaching danger to the warren, with Pipkin's first line in the film being the amusing assertion that a bad danger is not good. And then Silver, showing more of the character he has in the book, whispers to the others, Is he alone? Seemingly considering the possibility of attacking Holly. Holly, sensing the atmosphere, asserts his status as captain of Owsler. Here is where Hazel crosses the Rubicon, more so than in the book, where his threat happens after the fight with Holly and the other two Owsler members. He bravely squares up to Holly, who is much larger than him, and tells him to go or he will be killed. We see the shocked reaction of his companions. From this moment on, they have to leave or they will be killed, as Holly demonstrates by immediately attacking Hazel. The rawr sound Holly makes as he attacks has always seemed a bit forced to me, as if the human actor is still finding his way into the idea of portraying a non-human animal. However, these sounds become a lot more convincing very quickly, as the watching Bigwig, his decision seemingly forced by this turn of events, falls on Holly, knocking him on his back. In the film, Bigwig's decision to leave with the others is therefore made a bit more interesting. He could have crept off, leaving Hazel to his fate. Equally, he could have joined in, pretending to have changed his mind about leaving the Owsler, though this would have been a very different bigwing, and not one worthy of any respect. Indeed, here, clearly in conflict about his place in the Warren, he defends a rabbit who he does not seem to know that well from one of the most powerful rabbits in the Warren. In shock, Holly realises he doesn't have a chance now, and leaves. Blackberry comments that Holly will be back soon with more Owsler, so Bigwig says he will go with them. They move on, following Bigwig away from Sandalford, as Hazel and Fiverr pause for a second and exchange a glance, seemingly unable to take in what has just happened. 
John Ruth has commented on this look by saying that Hazel is thinking, quote, you are bigger than me, tougher than me, you are in the Owsler, and here I am, I am trying to be a leader, end quote. This is interesting thought, as the lost paragraph tension between Bigwig and Hazel is definitely a feature of the film. And isn't it extraordinary to have an animation where a look between characters can seem to convey so much? Well, it certainly was back then. Briefly, the uplifting end title theme plays, but with a lighter clarinet version indicating that this is overall an optimistic moment in the story. But this will not last for long. Comparison with the book. This section of the film marks the first significant diversion from the narrative of the book since the displacement of the story of the blessing of El Echera to the film's opening. I have heard the view expressed that one unfortunate effect of the speed of, at which the film tells the story is that the leadership role of Hazel is a little diminished in the telling, and that is certainly the case here, with the whole of his decision to leave Sandalford taking place off stage, so to speak. However, he makes up for this a little by threatening Captain Holly before any violence has even happened. An effective moment of leadership, though without Bigwig's intervention it may well not have paid off. It is also the section of the film in which the harsher nature of the Sandalford Owsler is made very clear, just in time for us to never see them again. So what was this done for? I suspect it was just to heighten the sense of drama. However, the Owsler herding does and even kittens back to Sandalford does at least address the later doe problem a little more directly. In this version, they did try to take some with them, only ending up with the hapless Violet. In fact, the band that actually gets away is smaller than in the book, having started out far larger. One wonders how that larger group, including kittens, would have fared, bearing in mind later events on their journey to Watership Down. Next time. The initial optimism of the eight rabbits is dampened a little by a wood, a river, and a dog. Mm -hmm.